Hello and welcome back to the show. We've traveled across the Atlantic to the urban jungle of New York City. Here in the US, a nation of 325 million inhabitants, agriculture only represents about 1% of the total workforce. But here in the temple of a consumer society, it is the intensive agricultural model that dominates. That means unlike in the EU, where the precautionary principle bans many such practices, the use of chlorine-washed chicken, growth hormone beef, and genetically modified organisms is commonplace. Now, with the Donald Trump administration vowing to roll back that already limited regulation, our guests and reports will take a closer look at what exactly goes into American food. Come to uh, Central Park in Central Manhattan uh, to talk a bit further about uh, food hygiene here in the U.S. And we're joined by uh, Michael Hansen of uh, the Consumer Reports magazine, the biggest consumer protection magazine in the U.S. Uh, tell us more uh, about the differences between food safety standards here in the U.S. and in the EU. The main difference between the U.S. and Europe is in how food is raised. There's a much more industrial style uh, food uh, uh, production here. So that means animals that are fed all sorts of antibiotics. There's uh, hormones. Europe doesn't allow any use of drugs for growth promotion purposes. It's considered unethical to give a drug to an animal except to treat disease. Here, the vast majority of antibiotics that are given to animals are for growth promotion and what's called disease uh, prevention. So you're eating chicken and, and I've got a, a beef hot dog. Uh, what kind of risks are, are U.S. consumers running when they, when they consume just typical U.S. Uh, food? Well, with typical U.S. food uh, that's industrially raised like this, one of the big problems is the use of antibiotics, and that leads to antibiotic-resistant bacteria. You're looking at a potential uh, nightmare where no antibiotics. You could get a simple infection and no antibiotic would treat it. Do you say over the, the years that you've been following the situation, have there been improvements? Sir? If I take the, over the long term, there's been this drastic expansion in GMOs and they were sold to us as, oh, we'll be able to produce more nutritious crops and we'll be able to feed people. And when you look at it 30 years later, there is no increase in yield that is due to GMOs. They don't make food more nutritious. They basically enable us to use a lot more pesticides, glyphosate. So 94% of all the soybeans in the um, US are glyphosate tolerant. 89% of the corn has glyphosate tolerance. So all it is is these uh, GMOs are just a way to sell a lot more uh, pesticides and in particular glyphosate. Back in 2011, Barack Obama passed the Food Safety and Modernization Act. What's the future for food safety well, under the Trump administration? Any sort of forward movement that there was on food safety looks like it's going to stall because who the Trump administration is putting into place to be heads of agencies and where they're getting those people is from the industry that was regulated. So the priority here in the U.S. is, is, is what? It's consumer safety or it's, it's the safety of big businesses? Particularly under the Trump administration, it's more the interests of the large corporations and not the safety of uh, consumers. It, it was a little bit better under Obama, but that was only because he was being pushed. But on areas like trying to reduce the level of antibiotics, there have been bills put into Congress literally for the last 15 years. And there's just no movement because the power of the ag industry is so large. That's why in Europe, your organic label comes from basically small farms, animals that have just eaten this. So that means something. In this country, particularly in the meat area, the organic label, you can still use all these bad practices. Michael Hansen of Consumer Reports, thanks so much uh, for Thank you. all your insights. Now we're gonna go and take a look at the other side of the story. I visited a farm in upstate New York, which is making the most of all the innovation they can to increase their productivity. Here at Old McDonald's farm, the techniques aren't really traditional. The herd is fed genetically modified grain and is treated with antibiotics when animals fall ill. With over 2,000 cows in the dairy operation, it's an intensive farm like many at the heart of the American model. I think the way we farm is very efficient and I think with challenges that are presented to us this day and age, this is going to be the type of operation that 
is of the future and the only one that's going to survive. Over the past 15 years, the Robbins operation has swallowed up half a dozen smaller farms. That's mirrored changes in American agriculture as farms have got bigger. Like many American farmers, the 10,000 tons of corn and soybean grown here are genetically modified. For farmer Brian, the technological advances are good for everyone. Using GM crops, we're using less fuel, uh, less fertilizer, less chemicals. Um, it's, it's really a, a lot less inputs that we all view as, as potentially harmful to the environment. It's essential that we have access to this type of technology. And I believe if we didn't have it, we would not be able to feed hardly any of our population today. I think it's the only way of the future. Since hitting the markets 20 years ago, transgenic GMOs now represent 90% of some American crops. At places like Cornell University, researchers are working on a new cutting edge in genetical modification. This next generation is known as gene editing. It's called CRISPR technology, and it allows scientists to target specific elements of a crop's genetic makeup, opening up a whole new range of options. With CRISPR, you can actually make very specific changes. We are essentially not limited by what we can do to improve the plant. So we can change a number of characteristics. We can improve yield, we can improve disease resistance, we can improve taste, we can improve color. We can do a lot of things to different plants now. GMO 2.0 is not just about improving the product's flavor. Unlike transgenics, the new technology only swaps genes within a single species. For its proponents, it can help meet the demands of a growing population. By 2050, it's expected that wheat production has to increase by 50%. We're not going to be able to do that at the current rate of increase in yield, which is about 1% increase per year through traditional breeding. We're just not going to make it. So we have to be open to these other technologies. The future of intensive agriculture may have already arrived in New Jersey. Just a short drive from Manhattan in these nondescript hangars is a vertical farm. In the past decade, the company Aero Farms has perfected these towers of leafy greens. By bringing food production closer to cities, it helps reduce transport costs and creates jobs. When we looked at an area of historically high unemployment, so how do we create jobs? How do we create more economic development? We also looked at it as an area, it's a food desert, so meaning access to fresh food is very limited. So here we are, we, not only do we bring the farm, we open up our doors, we have a farm stand, the community can come in and get access to freshly harvested food. Vertical farms can control every element of the crop's environment. They use 95% less water, zero pesticides, and can grow a lettuce almost four times faster than outdoors, a potential game changer in the race to increase productivity. This is a way of growing that changes the equation because of our year-round productivity, because of the vertical nature, because of our faster growing cycle, and also because there's no weeds. This is a way of growing that's 390 times more productive than the field farm. Innovation has helped American farmers keep prices low and increase production for decades. Agriculture in the U.S. is likely to remain dependent on science and technology to ensure it can feed a growing population. And to continue talking about agriculture and particularly the sustainable element of agriculture here in the United States, we've come to the Green Market at Union Square here in New York. We're joined by Avashi Rangan of the Grace Communication Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us. This is a very beautiful market yeah. here. Is there a growing expectation for better quality of food here in the United States, or is it perhaps limited to New York? You know, it's really interesting. About 20 years ago, when you'd ask consumers, they would say that they come to buy food like this for their own health. And over the last 20 years, that's really changed. And consumer sentiment in the United States has really shifted from not just caring about their health, but caring about buying local. As they also care if lots of pesticides were used or lots of drugs were used every day, which is very common in our agricultural system. System. Are you seeing a move uh, uh, away from uh, uh, intensive farming towards more sustainable farming, given that, it has to be said, intensive farming really does still dominate the model here in the United States? It does. Um, what's really interesting is that organic, for example, has grown 20% a year for the last 20 years in the market. It is the fastest growing segment of agriculture, and it's the only growing segment of agriculture. In fact, a lot of food companies, processed food companies, are shrinking in their sales sales while organic sales are really booming. People know that they want more and they're looking for it. They're willing to pay more for it. And as the economies of scale come into balance and we can up that 
we'll start to see some of those prices drop slightly, but our food's a little bit too cheap here, and we don't really factor in all of the externalized costs of production. But you mentioned there uh, that the organic things is at a, a premium price, it is more expensive. Mm -hmm. Is there not a risk that it's becoming, it is essentially an elitist part of the market? Organic is not something that necessarily is only for the elite. In fact, there's lots of ways to economize and buy in season and get good prices for it. And that said, the market is growing. It is what consumers want, and I think we're only going to see that grow. One question about GM, uh, GMO labeling. Why do you think uh, there has been uh, a certain failure to have a strict labeling and regulation on GMO? I mean, we in this country have a big problem with transparency, and it's actually a big difference between Europe and the United States. In Europe, it's much easier to get dis, uh, disclosure of what you're putting into your foods. Um, so when you have a caramel color, for example, in your foods, you will label the exact caramel color number. We don't do that. In fact, we have a lot of regulations that almost allow manufacturers to hide ingredients under flavorings or colors so you don't even know, even GMO ingredients. And so the problem here in this country is that mandatory GMO labeling is not palatable. And we have a huge industry that fights against that because they don't want to disclose. The amount of money that went into the fight against mandatory GMO labeling state by state in California and Vermont at the federal level is tremendous compared to the amount of money on the other side. So those who have vested interests in these products are in fact vested in making sure that they don't have to label that puts their product at any risk. On the other hand, more than 90% of consumers in this country have said repeatedly, survey after survey, that they want this stuff to be labeled. And so it's a big disconnect where really the demand for that is not being met by the supply. And that's really wrong if you're having a truly free and transparent market. Okay, Vashi, uh, Rangan, thanks so much for your time. You're welcome, thank you. Uh, we're going to move away from the street market here in New York to take a look at the situation in the street food vendors in Thailand. Glorious Kazali reports from Bangkok. Bangkok is famous for its street food, with stalls open day and night. Noodle soups are just some of the menu options, bringing together Thais and tourists around the iconic low tables. Street food for lunch or dinner normally. Because, you know, it's hectic town, and you see that the traffic is very bad. The military junta has vowed to clean up the streets and crack down on vendors in parts of the capital. It's a question of safety and order, they say. But it's not going down well in Silom, a hotspot of Bangkok street food culture. People like to eat on the streets, and this uh, closer is a uh, half many years ago. It's a bad news for me. If not have street food, look uh, quiet. Yep. And this is a good for big company. Some accuse authorities of trying to please real estate developers in a quest to modernize Bangkok. The capital is rapidly changing and so is the Thai countryside when it comes to agricultural methods. The use of pesticides is on the rise, with official figures showing imports multiplied by four within 10 years. Jani Khan returned to the province of Rayong to take over her parents' farm. She has increased productivity in her 71 acres of pineapple crops. People use pesticides because of the competition. Customers want beautiful looking products. If they don't look good, they won't buy them. Thailand is the top exporter of canned pineapples. And Jani Khan's fruits get tested for pesticide residues. My products have always been accepted, but I've met many farmers at the factory who've had theirs rejected and dumped. NGOs are campaigning to ban Paracat, a powerful pesticide that kills weeds. It's forbidden in the European Union, but this specialist believes it poses no serious health risks. Farmers can use um, as many as they can. Farmer uses wisely and spray only between the, the rows, so never damage the crops. The government, however, might regulate the use of paracat. In a country where gastronomy is highly valued, there's growing interest for more organic agriculture with less pesticides.
We're going to talk now about agriculture here in New York itself. We're joined by Melissa Metric of New York University. Thanks for so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, now, you're growing produce here. What kind of role in the future is urban agriculture going to have in New York and perhaps in other cities in, in, in the U.S.? The main role is just educating people about about agricultural practices, about seasonality, and sharing that knowledge, because that knowledge is also dying. This cultural knowledge of how to grow food um, is being lost. It's a way to connect people closer to their food system. Do you think that's important, to uh, making sure that people are connected with their food, knowing where it comes from? People have become disconnected where they don't know where their food comes from. You don't know the agricultural practices that certain businesses or farmers are using that could then affect the environment in many different ways. Knowing the practices that your, um, that your farmers use can affect the, the larger country as a whole. So this brings people back in touch with the food that they're consuming. Can it also help improve the diet of Americans, make sure they're getting healthier food more often? If kids are around certain produce, they're more likely to be aware of it, to um, want to try it more. You know, the known thing is that kids hate vegetables. But if you actually have them out here growing it, getting used to it, harvesting it, sowing it, they're so much more active in the process. They're, they're gonna want to eat it more. They're literally going to want to like harvest the fruits that they grow. Melissa Metric, thank you so much for your thank time. You. That's all we've got time for in this special edition of the show from New York. We do hope you've enjoyed it. From myself and all of the team, goodbye.